Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 494, featuring an interview with the great Mr. Monty Singman. Uh, Monty is one of these guests, I think he'll be a classic uh, episode in the making here, because he's just got so much experience in so many different countries, and so many different roles and, and aspects of the games industry. He's got 30 plus, almost 40 years of experience in the U.S. industry, as well as the uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, and I think even some other countries, uh, Taiwan, <laughs> the list just goes on and on. He's kind of an international game developer extraordinaire. He's worked uh, Atari, Accolade, Capcom, Electronic Arts, Sony. Uh, he's done a lot of work with the hardware as well as uh, software. He's worked on the John Madden uh, football series for the 3DO. He's got a lot to say in, the, in here about this, as well as a lot of uh, interest in mobile uh, gaming, meta gaming, uh, virtual, <laughs> Web3 stuff. <laughs> You know, he's just got a lot to say, and he doesn't mind uh, saying his uh, true opinions on all this stuff. So I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. I know it's a great pleasure to interview him. Uh, so anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Monty Singman. Hello, folks. I am here with Mr. Monty Singman. He is the founder and CEO of Radiance Digital Entertainment based in Shanghai. He's a professor at Shanghai Theater Academy, or at least, I don't know if that's, you, you can update this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Coordinator of IGDA, uh, also founder CEO of Zona, and now he's the CEO of Lemuria, a Web3 game infrastructure and a decentralized publisher. He's got over 30 years in the games industry. It's pretty impressive stuff. You know, you're going to be really excited. <laughs> we start diving into this, uh, this guy's uh, bio here. Uh, worked at Atari, worked at Accolade, Capcom, EA, Sony. Produced a John Madden uh, football test drive off-road, <laughs> Street Fighter. <laughs> That's one of my, uh, I like the Looney Tunes racing. That's a good one. Uh, Hello oh. Kitty, Roller Rescue, just a bunch of other things. And on top of all that, he produced and programmed one of the first ever commercial games in the greater China area back in 1986. And I mean, that's just a fraction <laughs> of the stuff. <laughs> and how are you today, Matt? Is, did I get all that right or anything you want to correct about that? No, no, that, that's that's good. I don't I don't even remember that 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 many that many titles <laughs> <laughs> well you know that's i guess that's what happens when you've been in the industry for 30 plus years you know well, let's talk a little bit about this uh, lemuria uh project i'm looking at some of your quotes you got a great twitter feed and a lot of stuff on linkedin too that's interesting uh videos uh but this one uh you know not quite you have to explain some of this to me i'm, I'm still fairly sure. naive okay. in the ways of uh, the uh, the stuff that's going on here i don't want to say clueless but pretty close <laughs> but anyway <laughs> uh, you say this is a you want to create a decentralized publishing service where no one person is the boss rather you break yes, down yes. the functions of a game publisher to collaborate with partners all over the world with the goal to create an organization that exists to serve the game developer and i know you looking at some of the tweets and things you've posted over the over the years you've been kind of critical of a lot of the assumptions uh, that people make about all this stuff. There's some, there's some, uh, con I feel, you know, so I've interviewed a lot of uh, developers on this show and I've heard often enough about this tension between the marketing people and the suits yeah, yeah. and the creative people. And, you know, there's ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a committee, you know, we can get into all that, but yeah, it seems right. like you're, you're trying to do something about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, against personally i'm not against the suit you know i i wear a suit once in a while if, if the meeting dress code is is, is calling for that uh, i'm not going to cut my hair but um i am against people talking out of their asses about about game productions or about the industry oh god i'm a whole career on based on that monthly <laughs> <laughs> 
so no, I, um, you know, I hate the term game expert. Actually, there was a, there was a gaming guild. They, they made a, they made an announcement of, uh, and, uh, using, using my name and my photo without me knowing it. And they quoted me, they put me game expert. And I, I raised hell. I mean, the biggest part of me being upset is the title they gave me because I don't think I'm in game, I'm a, I'm a game expert. They're gamers who call themselves game, game expert. They're crypto enthusiasts call, calling themselves game experts because they play one or two games. Mm. Um, I don't think you would call yourself a game expert. I mean, I've made games before and I work as one of the, one of the members in the game industry. I don't think I'm an expert. You know, I seriously, I, I probably know more than, than layman's. I mean, we can have a decent conversation about what's fun, you know, what constitutes fun or, or what's uh, replayability, how do you measure that? You know, there's, we, can, we can have a decent conversation about that and I'm sure we'll have arguments or, or where we would agree. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm still a student. I'm still a student. It, you know, I took a guest professor job in Shanghai Theater Academy only because I know more than the students. <laughs> and the school, the school wanted me uh, to lecture there. And so I actually put uh, Radiance, my first, my, well, my first startup in China. I put my first uh, startup in China in, in the campus. And since it's an art school, um, it's cool. You know, I, I had a, a lot of fun memories in teaching. Um, so, so anyway, I, I hate the term game expert. Um, but going back to your question, I, I think the evil in the industry comes from too much centralization of profit and power in the publishers. And, and I also uh, mentioned the ad networks. They take, see, at least publishers, they take away the profit and they may invest some of that profit back in game productions. They may, right? You know, it makes sense. They, they would invest some of that profit into game productions, new games or sequels. But ad networks don't do that. Ad networks, they just suck the blood out of the game industry. And, you know, they're not even in game industry. They just make money from game industry. And it, it, it saddens me that we got lazy in engaging the, the gamers. We, we don't really, well, we haven't been really uh, taking care of the communities. Mm -hmm. And so we just buy traffic. Right. And, and in fact, based on personal experience, I'm watching the same ads over and over and over again, you know, over the years and or similar ads, sometimes exactly the same ad over and over again. And so they are spending, wasting money on CPM and maybe even on CPI. Um, and anyway, I just think it's a lazy, lazy uh, way to promote marketing. I, you know, I obviously I'm old school. I miss the old days where, you know, we still had game magazines and the editors more or less knew what they're talking about. Uh, and yeah, so there's an audience, you know, you can talk to a, a journalist and there's someone knowledgeable of video games. But now you just have uh, people looking at data numbers and they buy traffic and they have all these science around traffic uh, keywords. Uh, what time of day do you do you expose you know the you know the ads, and you know I don't know if you noticed or not the traffic got more and more expensive. It seems like the the bidding mechanism uh, is only one way up. The ads get more and more expensive. So in the mobile space, this is already happening. Casual, hyper casual games are having a real tough time. You know, a lot of companies that used to be huge, they're, they're not doing that well because the ads got too expensive. Uh, and, and that's starting to encroach into casual games. So even Match 3 and a lot of casual games are having a tough time uh, having their uh, ROI, you know, paying, paying for the, the ad, ad cost. Um, and I would hate to see the only games, you know, that we see on mobile phones are hardcore games and high R2 games, you know, instead of high DAU games. Um, so, so I think the ecosystem is, 
is not healthy right now. And I, I think Apple's uh, user privacy change of policy that 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 did not help that did not help the the uh, industry. But I, I think it's good for for privacy. I couldn't believe I can I cannot believe they allowed ads to look at my behaviors in other ads. I didn't know that's what's going on. Um, uh, that's just bad. Like I'm not I'm not really for that. Uh, I'm I'm happy that my privacy is protected. Anyway, I, I think I digress a little over to the ads, but uh, the ads, buying ads, that that user acquisition is in my mind. I think it's hurting the industry in, in a big way. So anyway, coming back, I don't I don't want to give publishers too much power. Um, I worked for publishers actually most of my career. Um, and when I finally started out my own business, I realized I didn't like publishing. And I wasn't good at publishing. I really wasn't. Until I realized, well, to survive in this industry, you, you better learn. Uh, I think it was, it was good. And it was, uh, I was happy, you know, as a game developer. I was happy because publishing, you know, dealing with consumer, that's other people's business. I could just focus on what I like. But, um, you know, over the years, I started thinking, well, I better know how to make money with, with my games. Um, so what I do, what I would like to do is I want to break down what a publisher does into a lot of different pieces, into a lot of different functions. And, and, and as you know, there are um, QA teams all over the world. There's translation agencies all over the world. So we can sign up three or four of them. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, and, and, and allow the game developers who join our network to, uh, to select which, which ones they want to work with. Uh, yeah, and you know, potentially ad network is the same. You don't have to go with one ad network. If you, if you want to, you know, based on your budget, you know, I want to partner with different ad networks. So if people want to buy traffic, they can. And maybe community manager is the same way. I mean, I, I work with, a handful of cool community managers in, in different countries. There's a kid, uh, Mattia, he's like 21. He speaks Italian and English. And so he can, he can actually take care of my, my Italian channel and English channel and just kind of maintain order and, and stay positive. Uh, and it's, it's great, you know, he, he gets paid doing what he likes and uh, I don't have to maintain a headcount in the, in the office. So, I mean, you understand this after the pandemic, a lot of people would prefer remote working. So why wouldn't we structure the company so that instead of people working remotely, so it's these publishing functions are functioning remotely. Hmm. That's a general idea. That sounds great. I mean, I'm like you, I grew up in the time when, you know, everybody liked to demonize the, the publishers and that was the, you know, look how evil yeah, they yeah. are and they're you know, taking all the money from the <laughs> creative ties. But, you know, it's like that was, a, you know, that this new devil, if you will, <laughs> it could be, it sounds, you know, even more sinister with all like the data collection and the surveillance aspects, right. the endless fuelers and all that stuff. Uh, I want, I'm really, I, I wanted to jump in. I'm just, I, you know, I heard that other interview that you did. I, I forget it was, I think it was at a conference where you were talking about the business of, uh, of fun. Like, what mm. is that? And you had this, this great example. I went and did a little research on it. <laughs> I was so curious <laughs> about this experience, because you talked about an experiment in there uh, where there were people in a, like a white room, and they were basically just... Oh, just well, you remember? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Boredom. Just, like yeah. boredom let's let's see how bored uh, we can make these people and then, and then the only thing there to relieve the boredom was this button that you could press that i guess would cost you the metal <laughs> yeah yeah you'll get electrocuted yeah and i mean that you talked a lot about that i've never heard that sort of thinking before oh. about like oh what, no that's a real that's a real experience like, I, I, I mean, all i can say about it it's like what the hell is going on with that <laughs> Well, okay, um, I, I fully understand it. I think 
you know, if you think about it, people really fear boredom. They fear being alone. They fear having no sensory input. I mean, really fear. Um, I don't know if you live alone or if you lived alone. I would turn on the TV and just let it play or, or radio. And that's, that's part of it. We, uh, it's really scary. I mean, unless you look for that experience, you know, like it made it meditation. Mm-hmm. But if you're not, you have uh, sensory deprivation and you're not really uh, looking for that experience. It's, it's really frightening. I believe that experiment was, I could be wrong, it's like 30, 30 minutes and there's nothing on the wall. Everything was white. There's no, nothing for you to, to focus. There's nothing stimulating. And the buzzer was made of metal. If you, if you press it, it makes sound, obviously, but you get zapped. And it turns out there's a guy so guys are worse than, than, than women. That's one of the research outcome. Um, the other part was uh, there was a guy. Yeah, there, huh? <laughs> yeah. I think there was a guy, yeah, who's, uh, who pressed it like 80, 90% of the time. So yeah, we really, we really. People, more of the men than women chose to give themselves at least one mild shock. <laughs> <laughs> only 15 minutes what so you're just so bored you're like shocking yourself yeah yeah so pain is better than boredom pain is better it's scary. than boredom yeah so really, I remember this is just when, research right? hey when, when I first moved to Bay Area in 1989 I, you know, there was, this was the BBS dial-up days. I remember it was like 1200 bulb. And I joined, uh, <laughs> I, I joined the uh, BBS and I was like, you know, I was like 21, 22. And I was like um, talking to random chicks, you know, in the, in the forum in Bay Area. And then the, I guess, Sizop or anyway, the master of the, you know, and she's, she's nice. Uh, I, I think her name, Back then, it was Cleo. One day, we, we met in a park. You know, once in a while, they would do a gathering, and you get to see who you were chatting with. And she told me, Monty, there are things worse, far worse than loneliness. Uh, and, you know, so that ties up. But you would know, right? You're, you're a young man. You couldn't stand loneliness. So you, you were uh, chatting and dating with uh, random people. Some of them are not so nice. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Video games, on the other hand, I think helps you cross, you know, crossing those boredom, you know. So, so we would have, uh, I don't know, a few hours of boredom and you wouldn't know what to do. If you're not into watching TV, TV shows, movies, uh, mm-hmm. video games is one of those tools to, to kill time. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a terrible thing to kill time because... We only have finite amount of time on Earth. Uh, it's it's a, such a shame to kill it, but yeah, it some be. games are more fulfilling. Yeah, some games are more fulfilling than the others, uh, or or educational. Some of the uh, some of the herbs or Latin words or Greek words I learned from video games. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't. I wouldn't have other ways to 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 get to know them with mythology. So some, some games are better than the others in that respect. Um, I used to think that game developers ought to have some social responsibility. Um, we, do, we should do some good um, while we're making money. But then again, I don't think I should be critical of the other people. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, this is a business after all. I should just mind my, own, my, mind my own business. If I think that's the right thing to do, I should do my best to do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wish more developers would think like that. Yeah, it, it kind of shines some light, to, or kind of uh, the more I think about this pain button. Yeah. No, I've read, um, it's been, it's probably been decades since McGonagall wrote her book about uh, every, what was the title of that thing? Reality is Broken, I think. Because you talked mm-hmm. a lot about gamification. I realize it's like a couple of years <laughs> since you did that interview. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of the things I think a lot about is how so many, you know, I play a lot of MMORPGs, and my, my big thing is yep. regular role-playing games, computer role-playing games. But, you know, there's just an awful lot in those games that 
I don't think anybody would describe as fun. You know, it's just like painful. Oh, uh, grinding. Yeah, grinding, and like sometimes you lose, or sometimes something terrible happens, and you're yelling, "Oh, hey, you!" Hey, but, ah, but hey, hey, That's hey, Mac, like but, pain but but our life, our life is most of the time, our life is great. You know, <laughs> and and you it used to take so little. So, did you play EverQuest? I think they're all the same. A little bit. I was. I came in more and during the. Uh, I went from muds. Basically, went from muds straight to World of uh, Warcraft. Okay, that's good. I kind of skipped I, a few things. I wish I had been. I didn't even have a, a broadband. <laughs> oh wow! I played World EQ. I played EQ for years. I think I played EQ on, on, on dial-up. Oh, you could play that on dial-up. I guess you could. You know, yeah, so that's that early uh, MMORPG era. So, so Matt, I made a I made a few MMORPGs, and, and and I think the the MO in MMORPG is that uh, at first you get a lot of satisfactions, you know, like five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, few hours, and then it gets harder and harder because but by the time you're addicted to the sense of achievement you know like um, level up you know that sound thing you know anyway that sound is from eq we we all miss that sound um after being leveled up and then and remember i don't know if you have that term in your game uh every 10 levels you hit the uh, hell level or hell yeah we call it hell level hell so you takes yeah hell level you take it takes uh twice the xp to level up <laughs> no i don't know so every okay but, but well, you know, that's an interesting idea. So that's just a yeah, hell level. And and you know, I have to say, you know, every other day I feel like a hell level these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, okay. the effort, yeah, effort is doubled. We used to put our head down. Uh, whether you do art or you're a programmer, right? You 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 do your you do your thing and it works, you know, then, then you get your dopamine. And then it takes a lot more for you, for you to get your dopamine hit. A lot more. Uh, and I think part of it is we, we get, you, we, I guess we get desensitized by the same amount of dopamine. So now you need more dopamine. I mean, that certainly was the case for me. I was a programmer and that wasn't good enough. I wanted to be a senior programmer. And then I wanted to be a lead programmer, and then I wanted to be a technical director. And, and then I realized I wasn't programming that much. I was doing uh, a lot of documentations and, and management and you know, project management, checking progress, and that, that wasn't cool. And, and when you're a lead programmer, you know, if you're a good one, you actually let your programmers pick what they want to work on. So I would work on you know, crap that nobody wants to work on, like user interface. Uh, because I, I gotta I gotta preserve reserve some time for for checking status and you know helping the guys debug and you know on PlayStation One you know making the emulator CDs you know all that boring stuff administrative stuff um, yeah so on one hand you're trying to get you want to become a more important person and I think that's fine. I think that's fine. You know, you, you're a programmer. You watch, you look at the people in the meeting room with a glass door. You want to know what they're talking about in those rooms. You know, are they talking about me? Are they talking about the game? Are they going to cancel the project? What are they talking about? Uh, how could they know more about the project more than I do, right? But, you know, they're, they, they, they dress nicer and they, they look nicer, cleaner. And so they're, they're <laughs> and they don't smell so, they don't smell so bad. Uh, <laughs> So, so they're in the room. And one day I got to be in the room and I realized, you know, I'm, I'm as dumb as any one of them. You know, I make mistakes and the same thing, the younger guys out, out, outside, the, outside the, the meeting rooms, they wanna, they wanna be in. And when I ran my own business, I make mistakes just like any other guy, just like any of the bozo bosses I used to, I used to serve. And, you know, so it's humbling. It's humbling that I, I, I became less critical of other people. You know, it's easy for you to criticize people all day until, you know, it's you yeah. that does it. And when you're in the driver's seat, 
uh, it's just, I don't know. Have you, have you, um, have you played baseball? Sure. When you're a hitter, <laughs> not professionally. Oh my. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Still, still, but even, but even for fun, <clears throat> when you're, when we're either a hitter with a, with a pitcher, man, there's a lot of psychological stress, you know, especially with people booing and cheering all, all at the same time. I couldn't perform a hundred percent. I couldn't. And uh, so, you know, this is, this is, I guess I'm talking about, have you tried to do it yourself, you know, before you criticize someone and, you know, in, in, in that position. So it's, it's, it's not easy. And yeah. So coming back to this, uh, publisher decentralized publishing you know uh, maybe it'll work maybe it won't but i want to i want to start something so game developers are not so helpless when they finish a game they're like what now mm -hmm. right i mean i i have friends who are finishing game a game now and they're they're wondering how do they get apple featured and they you know they have to go to website and, and learn all that stuff themselves and a lot of them, a lot of developers, you know, they want to be on console and they're not part of the good old boy network. And, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to apply for the dev kids. And it's, it's, not, it's not so transparent for everyone. For, for some of us, we, you know, we, we can find friends to help us out. But for some people, uh, they're, they're not so fortunate. Yeah. And, and yeah, so anyway, I, I realized I want to have a, business to try to be helpful and if it doesn't work then it doesn't work that's that's yeah. the you know i often think the only way we're really going to make progress is if we can find ways for those you know the kids or the, the random person that's just got this brilliant you know the next minecraft sort of game but doesn't know anything about you know maybe they, they've made this thing but they don't know anything about like how do i get it out there how do i you know, market right. engine on it. So, I mean, the easier we can make that process, you know, I think we're going to see amazing things start to happen. So, you know, I'm really, you know, pleased to, I think you got the right idea here. Not surprising. Now, I was also thinking though, as, as you were talking, <laughs> I don't know if you, have you ever read a book called the, the Peter Principle? I, I, I know Peter Principle. I don't think I've read that book. It's a funny book. It's uh, hilarious, but yeah, it's the, I don't know. I've, I, I, you know, my background, my whole professional life has been uh, in the academy, university uh, setting. You know, I've definitely witnessed it there. You know, where maybe somebody comes in, maybe they're really good at teaching, and the students yeah. really like them, and they're doing a great job. So of course they're the ones that get tapped to uh, leave that and yeah. go off and be some kind of administrator, associate, something, something. Uh, dean or whatever so they end up uh doing something else besides teaching which they're probably not nearly as good at <laughs> yeah so I, it's just everything kind of bubble you kind of get from basically the, the thesis you get kind of promoted into and promoted and yeah finally you hit a level of incompetence uh -huh. you're so far yeah. away from that thing that you know you really were talented so do you, i mean do you see that same thing in the games industry oh i do um Right before I left Taiwan for Silicon Valley, there was a guy in the in the government office, and he came from the Taiwanese Air Force, and he was in in Taiwan. It's called Triple I, like Information, you know, whatever society. So it's a government entity of keeping track of the information industry, you know, the computer. And and obviously he doesn't know shit about computer science or the industry. He's 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 from the Air Force. So he told me, like, Monty, you know, a lot of, uh, and I was like 19 or 20, I was a little kid. And, and he told me, you know, a lot of guys who got, you know, master degrees, you know, was like really smart uh, and they're programmers and they, they probably got their degrees from the state. They come back and they want to get a promotion, you know, in the government. He said, how do I know who's going to be good in, in managerial positions? So since they're programmers, I got to pick the best programmer, pick the best programmers out of them. So if, they're there, if they are good in their current job, then there may be a, there's maybe a chance that they will excel in this new, new position. And I, 
that stuck with me for, for, for many years because so, so I don't, I'm not very sympathetic towards people who are like, well, I'm not a good programmer. I may be better in, in management. So uh, promote me to management. And I don't buy that. So at EA, we had, a, we had an expression. You better get into management before they find out you can't program. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. You better get uh, That was EA's motto. <laughs> That was, that was in my department. You better get into management yeah. before they figure out you can't program. I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I I was I was now, Trip I was not Hawkins, bad. Trip Hawkins wasn't saying that, was he? No, 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 no. He was no, he was uh he he's nice. I uh I, I met him once, but he was already on his way out. He was doing 3DO at the time. So I spent a lot of time. I was an EA employee, but I spent a lot of time in videos office. Hmm. Um, yeah, there. Th- th- that was uh, yeah, it was crazy days. It was uh, cartridges going out and CD-ROMs coming in. And um, the reason I got, got a chance to to work at EA was because my experience at Sony. My my Japanese boss was one of the creators of uh, CD-DA. CD-ROM ripbook, the, the audio uh, music CD format. And then mm-hmm. some of my colleagues in Monterey, they were the founders of CD, CD, CD-ROM uh, yellow book, basically the ISO 9660 format. I was surrounded by these, uh, these uh, historical legends. No, seriously, like um, now we don't care. We don't care about the CD, you know, CD, who created CD, who invented CD, who was on the committee. What's uh, uh, what was red book? What was green book? What was yellow book? Nobody cares. But uh, for a while, remember the term multimedia? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, this this was important. All these industry formats, it was important. Uh, CD ROM green book is CD CD audio video interleave, and Microsoft basically just copied it and called it ABI audio video interleave. And so they turned a CD format into a file system. Sony was pissed. Before, before ABI, uh, Sony was, uh, uh, you know, so, Sony liked Microsoft. They partnered well. And then when Microsoft started uh, copying Sony's, Sony's stuff, then Sony didn't like them that much. Well, you can't blame them. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we should do a little, a little bit of your history because I know there's... Uh... I, don't, I think people are just going to be amazed at all the stuff you've done, all the places you've been. And <laughs> hey, you know what? There are times I feel like Forrest Gump. Yeah. Let me uh, <laughs> before we jump in, though. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what Web three and the metaverse, and you know, this is we don't have to. The mirror. We don't have to, but we, we we can. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to, but we can. You know, I. <clears throat> You can, you'll have to explain what all this what all this is. <laughs> okay, so most of the yeah, most of the most of the blockchain games are using Oops. using a, a, a wallet like MetaMask uh, as the login credentials. Have you have you done this before? Have you logged into this before? Yeah, I had some music playing. Is there a way to mute the music? I don't know. I only, I only play this game once. But this is one that utilizes some of the stuff you wanted to talk about, right? The... Yeah, that's it's using our SDK. Okay. You know? I get that. Okay, now it's muted. Okay, share. There we go. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what's going on with this? So, you know, all so-called GameFi, or some people call it blockchain games, are really financial software with the game's skin. And, you know, to be honest, I don't like them because, you know, they're not very specific. So, so these, are, these are basically, uh, I don't know, you know, where you can manage your, your cryptocurrencies, uh, and yeah, and you can start your adventure. 
But you know, for the most part, this is like investment. This is like investment and there's some game skill involved. Um, and there's like hundreds of games like this and they're usually trading card based. So these are using the, was it yeah. NFTs yeah, I yeah. think or blockchain? Um, so there are NFTs and then there's, a, there's a token called uh, MG, uh, MG token and you use MG token to, to buy uh, NFTs and you can use those NFT items to, to play in the game. And um, so I would say this is a more 19, no, 2017 to beginning of this year kind of model, GameFi. And I would like to believe GameFi is dead. <laughs> I would like to believe that seriously. And the, the nail that, that the last nail to close the uh, coffin, it was at Axe Infinity. All GameFi, all game five are Ponzi schemes. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to define Ponzi scheme, but basically, you know, if you go in and you punch in and you do your daily quest, you do stuff and you get, you get some rewards, mm -hmm. you get some money back. Where does the money come from? You know, if you're not generating real value in, in the world, where does the money come from? The money has to come from somewhere. So let me tell you, there are two places where they come from. The first... <laughs> So these type of games, NFT games, you have to buy NFT before you play. It's not free to play games. You have to buy. So, so the game companies will get you know, the first whatever income. So they keep taking the new money and give it to the old players. And so that's, that's the first revenue stream. So if you get more and more players coming in. That does then, sound like then, a Ponzi scheme. I mean, that's this classic that a, Ponzi. Yeah. That's yeah. the whole premise and behind the, that scam, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a lot like musical cheer too. Um, so, uh, you know. It all works great as long as there's plenty of new players coming in, but. Yeah, now yeah. there's a second source of income, which is the token, token, token appreciation. So they, they trade, they, they publish, they list all these tokens on exchanges. They're different kinds of crypto exchanges all over the world. So if, if the game's doing well and the, the, the price, token price goes up, you know, there's some profit there. So they could, you know, distribute that profit with a lot of the gamers. That's fine. But we're in a bear market right now. So the token appreciation income stream is dried up. And for one reason or another, people stop playing these uh, game by games. So, the, you know, you don't have new players anymore. So old players don't get incentivized. Then old, player, old players leave, new players don't come. That's the end of it. And it took me. It took me. A, it took me a few months to learn this. Like I didn't. I didn't know all these things I'm telling you right now. Back in February this year, wow. like I had to learn quick. I I learned to swim when I was drowning, um, and I I I run into a lot of scam scam artists. <laughs> a lot of come in, in in this in this business. You know, they they make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about, and you know you want to be humble. You want to learn, and you realize. Uh, they don't know. And I think in the U.S. it's a little better. It's a little better that since there's so much money in this business, so we have our elites, well-learned, well-educated people from, from the uh, finan financial side, what fintech, uh, coming into this business. The problem is um, when they call something games, and they're not involved in game industry, especially the production people involved. It's it's just it just um, they're, they're just basically portraying a, a shiny object, and and so so I had a post on LinkedIn and I was talking about fake videos, and you probably you know know some of this you know in game industry, especially in late '90s, there there are game studios going around showing you know computer graphics videos. It's not real gameplay. The publisher would, would, would think, wow, that, you know, that, that's a gameplay video. That's going to, that looks great, but that looks nothing like, like the real game. So that's coming back again with crypto. Um, they are games, that, they're game videos that they show that look fantastic. Uh, and they raise, they, they pre-sold NFT. It's called NFT pre-sales. 
and, or they issue tokens and they don't ship the game for a year and a half, sometimes even longer. There are, there are projects that they keep announcing strategic partnerships. And I counted 75 strategic partnerships, but what the, what the heck is the game? You know, they, they position the project as a game, right? They show you fancy videos with Snoop Dogg, with, you know, you know MTV-like videos, but that's not the game. There's no game. And when they, if they launch the game, I think that's when the music stops. Here, here's the problem. The, the scenario that they created is that the token price keep going up. There's more and more, the bubble get bigger and bigger and bigger. Look, there's no game in the universe that can live up to that expectation. There isn't. So when they launch the game, that's the beginning of the, the, of the end for, for that project. So I don't, I, obviously I don't like that business. I don't like that model because at the end, a lot of people's life savings will be wiped out. Um, whether, whether you like it or not, you cannot control the people, how they, how they invest, right? So um, I, I thought about this for a long time. So first of all, um, I've been in the business for 36 years, not, not by cheating people out of their life savings, obviously, um, but I still see something valuable in this business. I think the, if we treat blockchain as a secure storage device, it's quite straightforward. You know, it's, it's secure. And, um, you know, you can argue about the power usage, you know, carbon footprint. Look, I, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not, I don't know. And, and obviously there, there are cheaper way to calculate, to create decentralized storage. Um, and I assume they'll work it out. I'm, I'm a game guy. You know, I only know how to make video games. It's the only thing I know how to do in, in this lifetime. So um, here's what I understand and, and what I experienced. On, on EverQuest, I went on eBay and I spent a thousand bucks and I bought a, uh, a shawl that will regenerate my, my HP. It, it was like a fantastical item, right? Mm -hmm. I literally spent a thousand dollars. And at PayPal and eBay and and it's the whole process was scary because I got scammed too, you know. Sometimes, um, so so now we have a more secure way, uh, and it's between player A and player B, and maybe the the arbitrator is is, is smart contract, so it's secured, and you get what you paid for. Um, and also paid grinding. I don't know if you ever hired someone to play your account for you. That's also a scary experience. Yeah, I mean, at some level, like in EverQuest after level 50, it was so hard, you know, it, it would take three months for me to level one level. And I remember I was at level 54 for months after months after months and I was doing startup and I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was boring. You know, you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, anyway, long story short, there are times that, that it's so painful. Remember what we talked about? Pain is better than boredom. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, but boredom is bad too, right? <clears throat> yeah. Boredom is bad too, but we all want dopamine. So at some point you figure out, you figure out your time is more valuable. You know, it's, it's the money. So then you would pay money for someone to just kind of, jump over all that boring stuff that you already know. You don't need to experience the same stuff over and over again. Um, so paid grinding or leasing, it's interesting that you can, you know, you, you have a game item, you can lease it to other people. Either you get money or you get like 30% of, you know, whatever he gains with, with that item. So there's some interesting financial models or, or behaviors within games. I think can be enabled by blockchain. And, you know, obviously there, there will always be people say, well, you don't have to, to uh, use a uh, blockchain or decentralized the technology to do the same thing. Yeah, but then it's not standardized. You cannot have interoperability to, 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 to you know, move items between games. Yeah. Um, so, Because yeah. a lot of games, I, I mean, they've had their own in-game kind of currencies forever, right? I mean, that's nothing new. It's this interoperability 
can barely say the word, but <laughs> interoperability. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Key, right. It's really hard to do. It's not, it's not, this is not a engineering problem. You know, that you know, you have to involve copyright as well. You know, a, a IP holder grants you the license to use that IP in this game. Now you take that character to another game. How do you deal with that? Um so yeah, we're not. We're not, we're not here to solve all of that. We're not even near uh, uh, solving this problem. We're not even near. I think we'll be lucky to have um, interoperability within a few games. Let's just say all of the games from one game company, like you can, you can move them around. I think that's cool. Like game currencies and game characters or items. I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree, you don't have to use blockchain to do this. But blockchain is attracting a lot of investment and a lot of innovation and a lot of smart people. And so, you know, I, I, I would like to ride this wave. You know, I, I embrace innovation. You want to take a question from Miko? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think this is kind of, a, it's kind of fun, a good opportunity to ask. This sounds like we're kind of in the ballpark here. Uh, so the question is, mobile gaming seemed like a very promising and innovative new ground around 2010, 2015, but has since been dominated by exploitative free-to-play titles with bare-bones gameplay. What went wrong and what could be the future of mobile gaming? Wow, okay. It's very true, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say all of the free-to-play games are are boring. I think some are. I think I actually I think quite a few are. They they um, in China some of them uh, some people just call it addictive apps. They say they say these are not games. They are addictive apps because I think there's a book called Hooked. Right? There's a book. They they analyze where they deconstruct. Uh, why do we get addicted to things? So in that book they talked about what are the few things that people uh, uh, what are the uh, some of the behaviors products can do to to create habit forming behaviors? Yeah, hooked. How to build habit yeah. forming products? <laughs> okay. Be the next. So one. Matt. Okay. Yeah. This is this is the book. So a lot of Chinese Chinese game developers they hold this book as the Bible. Really? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we call some books, uh, some apps, or some games addictive apps for that reason, because I, I fall into, yeah, I fall into uh, that trap before, you know, you know, I, I play this game every day, day in and day out, and then one day I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not enjoying, I'm just, I just have a habit of doing this every day, you know, just like that, 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 you know, uh, you know, have, having my mouth open and, and just like do this thing. It's not, they're not video games. I'm not having fun and I'm not using my, my, my brains, but I, but I just do this every day. So I think part of our psyche has been cracked, has been decoded and they know what it takes. Like how many, how many notifications per day at what time uh, uh, is going to in, induce sort of a habit forming behavior. Uh, and you know, the data-driven, so, so people who are very good with data-driven analysis, like they, they, put, they put a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, data mining stuff in the apps or in the game. So they know what was the last page the players were on when they, when they quit the game. And you can, you can, you can uh, re really uh, deduce to meaningful, uh, I, guess, I guess, answers. And really smart people, I don't want to. I want. I don't want to name names. There, there are game companies out there, new ones uh, that got sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. What they told me was, Monty, a lot of times is counterintuitive. But if you use your common sense, why the hell are you gathering data? So instead, they let the data to tell them what to do. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So they would do series series of. A-B tests. And the names of those A-B tests are, are um, in the 
form of questions. So should this item be this much or that much? Should this level be this hard or that hard? So they will have hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of A-B tests. And when the results come back, they just do it. They just pick the, okay, it's A, okay, it's, it's B, it's A, it's B. And, you know, you, you can come up with a, an, a game that you didn't design. It's more or less, you know, you are told by your game players. So a lot of games are actually made that way. So I don't think they are necessarily not fun. There are quite a few, like, I'll just tell you this, the, on the iOS top grossing chart, the top 10, they, they really move. They really move. And I would say all of those games are really good at what I just told you. They're very good at doing this, you know, get, getting feedback from the users. Because, uh, do you say Miko? Yeah, Miko. Yeah, me, yeah. so as opposed to top grossing, we will be looking at, you know, most download, I guess. Oh, this is but crazy. even that's... I'll see if I can find the more recent chart. <laughs> okay, yeah, but, but most of these games are um, uh, made by methods, using methods. And all I, all I can tell you is uh, they are very, very disciplined in listening to data and not to use their common sense. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's such an important distinction between listening to the, you're not listening to what players say. Yeah. Listening to, you, you know, this this data that's kind of collected that you may not even be aware of. Uh, yes, yes. It. It's just kind of going yeah, on you, in the background all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so Matt, so this is the distinction between listen to what players say and listen to what players do. So these are the, I think, so the, they don't even call these games. They call them addictive apps. Apps. <laughs> That's, you know. Yeah, so the top 10, they lot. obviously make that because it's just being honest. <laughs> digital, I've yeah. the term uh, digital drugs before. Yeah. Well, uh, if you're enjoying it, you're having fun. I would say Monument Valley was a really good game. Um, I paid for it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I may or may not come back and play it again. But it's a beautiful game. And, and I enjoy the process. Yeah, this does look yeah, this, good. Yeah, this is a great game. Um, I literally went to London. And this, this, their office had a doorbell. And I literally rang the doorbell. And I, I licensed this game to China. So that's, that's one, of a, one of the good ones. Um, yeah, but, yeah, you know, have, Apple yeah, tried I, mean, to, I keep forgetting that we got all this international stuff we should we, we'd be talking about because you're probably one of the most experienced people I've ever had on the show, you know, when it oh. comes to... International, I mean, not, not just China, but I mean all these countries that you've you've worked with, and you know the the culture so well. Yeah, I remember that other interview you were talking about how different uh, it was with the with the Chinese gamers on this, uh, I guess, addictive app where they didn't even want they didn't even take you seriously if you hadn't spent like fifteen thousand dollars, you know, <laughs> uh, on these, uh, you know, whatever it was, whereas. You know, maybe we could just maybe talk a, a little bit about that. I know things, of course, I don't even know what's going on these days, but, you know, as somebody that's got so much experience in this area, you know what? Let me, yeah, how, you, how about this? You, you, you take let it me, Let me, I don't, I don't even no, know. No, 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 that's okay. No, that's, <laughs> that's right. Let me, let me finish answering Nico's question. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, Apple tried to level the playing ground by introducing Apple Arcade. Okay. Um. Yeah, I I don't think it's I don't think if it's fair for me to say that it it's not really working that way. But it, you know, it's a good effort. They try to level the playing ground and give give more exposure to indie games. And they they did pay a lot of the indie developers a lot of money up front or some money up front to to try to um, make sure the Apple Arcade arcade is 
you know, there's a lot of games in it. And, and all of these, to the best of my knowledge, are, are uh, premium. They're not, they're not free to play. Uh, so it's a subs subscription model. Yeah, um, yeah so this is, I, I say this is not bad. As a gamer, I think this is worth, worth the money. And, but if you're a game developer, you know, I assume Miko is, um, I would say, don't try to become a, a Monument Valley because that's, you know, like once in 10 years, you get a game that's great and it's full of heart and it makes money, you know, it, it's, it's rare. And, and I, I believe there are more, more examples like um, Edge of Hell or, or uh, I used to be, I used to really know the indie scenes. And I, and I think, so you just do what you want to do and you make sure you enjoy it. See, that's the thing, you know, with commercial games, they have got to make sure everybody likes it, where as many people like it as possible. But when it comes to indie games, you, you got to do what your heart tells you to do. You got to, you got to, so it's about creating art, you know? So, you know, people with a commercial mind may, may come and tell you, you know, got to make that green, you know, do this and do that. But you, you're an artist. If you're an indie game developer, you're an artist. You're not supposed to be commercial. You don't have to be commercial. But, you know, if you try to make a living while doing it, then it's a, it's, then it's a balancing act. You, you got to do. It's not easy. Yeah, I was just thinking like the, the indie developer. You know, I guess the you do have, you know, if you do have some creativity, some originality, and you're not really constrained, you can just put this, you can do what you want to do, right? Yeah. What's fun for you. But you don't have, if we consider it an advantage, all that data that we were talking about before from the big, you know, sort of the big. Yes, you don't. Just, they can, yeah, yeah they're going to say, oh, you, you should have made that thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have got this much more engagement i mean so that yeah who's going to win is it going to be the the data-driven games by I, algorithm i mean i don't know how to ai sort of thing or is it going to be it's the original is the really genius artist i guess really going to just still still win the game i hope so <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully, Miko, you think Miko will be satisfied? I wanted to get a little bit into your uh, into your early history. Okay, how early? <laughs> yeah, we could go all the <laughs> way back to the Apollo days. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, everybody I... likes to know, like, how did you, you know? How did you get interested? What kind of drew you in? You know, especially this okay. was mid eighties, right? Yeah the story yeah. that most people are familiar with. Okay, I'm going to tell you something that you probably didn't know before. So all of the arcades, all of the arcade boards that you know of, either they're American uh, designed arcade games or Japanese designed, they were all manufactured in Taiwan. You probably didn't know this. And Apple II, manufactured in Taiwan. This was the late 70s, early 80s. So I was, uh, I was 12 year old, 13 year old, and I would walk by, I don't know, convenience stores. I don't think we had convenience stores back then, bookstores, and they would have arcades. And it, I, I think they, are, they were gray market uh, arcade machines. They, meaning, you know, if the, the game company order like a thousand motherboards, they would make 2000. So they would deliver the 1,000 to, to whoever hired them and they would sell the, the rest locally. Um, and the local market was so small, like you know, most of them don't care. Um, I didn't know that back then. I just realized that I was surrounded by video games. Like all of a sudden there's Pong and uh, color, colored Pac-Man in color and uh, 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 Space Invaders. I, I think I, I, I went to level 35. I, you know, I, I must have zoned out or something. Yeah, uh, I, I was really good with that game. And skipping schools and, and, and uh, taking my lunch money, you know, on arcade, all, all that good stuff. Um, and, and when I was a kid, I liked to take, take, take apart toys and I liked to, put, you know, try to put them back together. Um, you know, 
as, as eventually I was old enough or you know good enough that I could put them back and you know with some enhancements. So when it comes to electronic games, I wanted to do the same. I wanted to learn figure out how to make them. And some people told me you got to learn to program. That's why I went to computer science school. You know, because you know that's just what I knew back then. You know, okay, you need to learn programming. Other than these books, you got to got to go to a university. So, so I went to university with that purpose. I wanted to make games. It was, you know, I, I had a very one track, single, single track mind. And I, I, I think I played Street Fighter one in Taipei. I, I participated in that tournament and I won. Oh, and nice. yeah, I was, I was 18 or 17. Yeah. And then, and then um, when I was 20. How many people were competing? 20, was this like a huge cultural phenomenon? No, 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 it wasn't that big. So you it was like... 10 or 20. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was bit. not bad. No. So, so when, when I was in Bay Area, I was in uh, Sunnyvale, Gulfland. And I, I participated in the Northern California Street Fighter II tournament. I got my ass kicked on the first round <laughs> by 12-year-old Vietnamese kids. Oh. They had to stand on the stools. And, oh. and I, oh, I know, it's not, it's not easy. I, I thought about that for a long time. I was like, I could be the programmer for this game. And, and eventually I was. That doesn't mean I'm going to, going to be a good player. And I thought, well, this is, this is something different. Like you could create a mechanism that you're the creator but other people can be better players than the creators. Um, I, you know, for me, you know, it was the first time I, I witnessed that kind of phenomenon. Um, I was not bad. You know, I, I finished Pit Fighter from Atari with one quarter and Gofflin, you know, they, they, they noticed me and they, they asked me to leave my, my, my phone number and my name and uh, Atari hired me to be a tester in a focus group. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, it turns out Gofflin, that specific Gofflin was uh, some, some kind of a magical place because Atari was nearby. They used that location as the location test. Capcom used it. And when I was at Capcom, I would go to the airport, you know, pick up my Japanese staff, drive them to the motel nearby and drive them to the Gofflin in the morning. And they will have the Sony Video 8, Hi8. Uh, Sunnyvale one, the one in Northern California. Yeah, I don't think we had this uh, water park with a go kart. It was just a miniature oh, golf. There you go. yeah. showed it for a second there. Uh huh. Yeah, so we did a lot of yeah yeah. This is it. We did a lot of uh, tournaments back then and location tests. And as a result, a lot of people like to go to that golf land because you get to see some games that may never ship. Because they're in location tests. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning when I was at Capcom, I witnessed sometimes you don't need you don't need good tools or even good processes to make good games. You just need you just need will. So you know, my Japanese colleagues, they just go there, one guy with a camcorder, stand there, and he would record players you know, emotional, facial reactions, the physical reactions, and they shoot, look at, shoot, shoot the screens. And based on that feedback, he will go back and write reports and then send it to Japan. And then when Japan, you know, uh, uh, they wake up in the morning, the programmers get the feedback. They, they would, you know, put in the new modifications, burn the new ROMs. Actually, they would, yeah, burn the new ROM. They put it on FTP and the, the staff in Sunnyvale would download them, burn new ROMs and put it in the next day, day in and day out. And look, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's hell. Those guys, those Japanese guys don't speak English and they had shitty food. They slept in a motel across the street and they just, they just full of, you know, sense of duty. I was blown away. I, just, I left EA and I joined this company and my Japanese colleagues were so professional. You know, so missionary. I was, I was blown away, and they that that experience, that experience transformed me. Seriously, like I, I was learning from the best practice in the United States for for game productions from EA. You know, EA created this this whole GDD TDD process 
um, game design document, technical design document. So, so there's a lot of methodology EA tried to create internally and that eventually leaked, you know, seeped out to the entire industry. And Japanese, they were doing something else. Like they were, they were doing something else, totally different. Not scientific, not, um, not, very, not, not very smart. You know, the, the first, one of the first games, Toshinden on PlayStation 1, it's a 3D fighting game. You know, they had no 3D tools. Uh, they had no 3D Max. They had no Sokimash or Alias or Wavefront. So they, they open a Excel spreadsheet or a piece of paper. They write down the coordinates by hand. <laughs> wow. They did. Or they write their own tools, you know, to, to do this. So in the early days, um, you just do whatever you have to. And, and uh, in, in the U.S., because we're better trained, because we, we, we went to computer science, some may actually sit down and write tools first. Like, you know, without tools, we cannot do this properly. So they will spend a year writing tools, writing tools and emulators before they write a line of game code. Um, and, and this is why, and you, you may invest a year of engineering resources doing tools. By the time you wanna do the game, the, the company you know, cancel the project already because they don't wanna wait that long. So, um, so there's a happy medium. I, I would say the best talents or best engin software engineers in Japan did not go to game industry. You know, they, they had better, you know, other careers to go. And, and I have to agree, back in my days, the, the best software engineers did not go to game industry. They probably went to banks and some, you know, Wall Street. Uh, the game industry probably was not on the, you know, top choice. But that's different now. You know, we've got kids from MIT and Berkeley in game industry it's just because they like it. So that's very different now. But back, back in the days, you, you, you got to balance, you know, uh, the, the, the constraints you know, budget constraints, time constraints. Um, so yeah, the Japanese, uh, my coworkers, I would say the game design capabilities were superior. They're, they're insane, like really, really good. Um, software engineers, not so much. You know, I, I, it was my aspiration to work on the Street Fighter source code. And by the time I got my chance to work on it, 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 was, it, was, not, it was not pleasant. It was, it was bad. Um, the original Street Fighter for the arcade was in assembly language. And uh, obviously they did a C, C++ port later, but uh, it, it was not pretty because the, the project was done by engineers who, who knew assembly language. Back in the arcade days, the hardware and software, they're very, very close. In fact, they designed, a lot of times they designed the hardware for the game. So original Street Fighter, the sprites were very big. It takes like two half of the screen's height. So they have to create a, the hardware that can move, move pixels that quickly on the, on the screen. Um, before that, before, before Street Fighters, you had uh, Final Fight. And Final Fight was still Capcom. The character is a little bigger. But you go back to Double Dragon, the, the characters were was tiny. You know, originally, the, the, the computer game characters were all tiny. You look at Rastan Saga. You look at uh, Double Dragon, they're all really, really small. And then Street Fighter, all of a sudden, they, they take a big chunk of the screen. Um, so that, that's a big move forward in the sprite engine. And in the early days of consoles, like PlayStation or Sega Saturns, going back to those days, all they talked about when they come up with a new console, they talked about how many pixels they can, pixels they can move on the screen or, or how many polygons can they draw in a second. Um, you, you rarely hear about those, those stats these days because those numbers are so high. It's, it's not even funny anymore. But back in the days, because the hardware constraints were so much, the game designers had to be so good. Otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't be fun. So I think as the technology got better and better, the storytelling and the gameplay mechanism became less and less innovative. And you know, something, same thing happens in Hollywood. And I, I would argue same thing happens in the music industry. They use technology to compensate for uh, lack of talents or lack of design. Um, you know, everything is like, uh, well, we'll handle it in the post-production or, or uh, you know, it, 
or you know special effects on the screen, shiny objects, explosions. But you know, um, in, in game industry, I think this happens a lot, and this is why I don't know if some of your uh, audience uh, do this. Like I used to keep several gigabyte of uh, arcade ROM uh, archive, and there's an emulator called Main, and so you get to in, you know check out thousands of arcade games, and it never ceased to amaze me. Some of them were so good. Like, seriously, I can still enjoy those games. Yeah. You know, 40 years later, I can still enjoy those games. Um, so, yeah. And, and when I first came to China, I had to interview, I had to hire a lot of people to fill up the, the studio. And uh, the people who I would hire are the, those people who played hundreds and hundreds of video games. And they can articulate why this game is better than that game and what would they would do differently. Um, mo most players or gamers, they think they can do game design. They don't necessarily have the ability to articul articulate well. Just like you, you like to watch movies, that, that doesn't make you a good movie director. Um, so, so, so I think game production is the same way. I just, you know, I've written some books about the the history of the, the video games industry and things and it's always i've always kind of been fascinated by that idea we've been talking about where the you know there was a point where especially in the arcade i would probably say me that's probably the main place where you saw that you, if you didn't know the if you didn't know the hardware you know forget about yeah. i mean it's just a totally different relationship uh, you know, we fast forward to today and there's this, this this common idea that, oh, you don't know, you want to make games, you don't need to know anything about programming. You don't you don't need to know anything about, you know, the hardware. It's it's totally separated now. And I just feel like something gets really lost. I agree. It's it's uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, how we make bread now. We use the rapid rising yeast. Well, I think some people have never tasted bread using the normal yeast. You know that that it takes overnight to to rise, and you know it's a it's a it tastes totally different. It's not the same thing, but but most of them probably won't mind. Like it's, so, recently, you know, I'll digress a little bit. Recently, I got into making the best cup of coffee that I could possibly make. So I found I found a guy who roasts his own coffee, and I make sure he just roasted last night or yesterday. So it's like within a week old, and I hand grind my, my coffee beans right before I drink. So if I drink one cup, I, I grind one cup worth of coffee, coffee powder. And, you know, hand pour, obviously. Holy crap, I never know coffee can taste this way. I used to just like them bitter. But uh, once you've done things like this sort of artisan, art, artisanal uh, way, uh, you, you can never go back. Like, I, I can't drink normal coffee. They're, they're just... Uh, I guess my French, French, my French friends at EA used to call our American coffee soft juice, and now, now uh, I what think they call it? Well, most <laughs> suck juice, suck juice. Yeah. So. Yes. So it's yeah. They so the the French from Montreal or the French French, um, they they think their coffee is so good, and our you know we were using percolators. You know I don't know if you remember the office coffee. And they they just hate it. They just hate the percolator coffee because, because it's sitting on the warmer for so long. Yeah. So oh yeah. Anyway, my, my point is, um, there's a lot of lost art. You know, um, I don't know if you remember back in 2010 ish, before 2010, there were hundreds of MMORPGs in the world, and and now we have very few. And you know most of them. Even Lord British uh, tried to make several. I don't think. I think the latest one might still be going on, but yeah, all those was it NC Soft and. Yeah, I mean some you of know, the stuff I've heard about yours. There's a lot I have had never heard of even. Um, there were so many to count back then. You can go to E3, and they're just they're just everywhere, and. You know, the hardest part to, to make in an MMOG, obviously, is a server, server bit. And, you know, I, I'm afraid a lot of the, the old timers have left the industry or retired. And, yeah, so obviously, some are still around. 
But this is one of the things I think it will become uh, lost art. And I don't know if you remember, we used to cycle palettes. So the sprites would look different, you know. So back in the 8-bit days, you would have a flame. That's one sprite. And they use different, they use different um, palette uh, indexes. And you can change the palette and the, it looks like the flame is, is burning. Color cycling, I think. One. Color, yeah, yeah, color cycling. Um, so people will just say, ah, you don't need that anymore. Yes, yeah, true. And, but there, there's like a, a thousand things like, like this that they, it saves a lot of space and it saves a lot of CPU and GPU. And uh, that's why our games are gigabytes big now. You know, it's like bigger than the operating system uh, in some cases. Um, it's because we're not crafting these things because it's not cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Madden football I did for EA, there was no loading screen. Nobody know, no, not too many people noticed this. The only people who noticed this was uh, QA team at Studio. I don't think even Trip knows this. Oh, that's a page. Okay, yeah, yeah, Moby, yeah. So, so one day my boss at EA, Luke Bartlett, uh, he came over and he threw a power cord over my neck and he started tightening the power cord, trying to uh, strangle me. <laughs> and he said, Monty, yeah, I know, it's nice management style. Um, <laughs> it's like, Monty, no loading screen, okay? I was like, oh, 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 okay. Look, I was new. I was new to making video games on CV. Nobody had the experience of making games on CV. Yeah, so he told me back then was, you know, people that might not have known about this era, but yeah, that was the big fear, right? Well, cartridges, it's boom, boom. That, CV yeah. is gonna take, you're gonna sit there for five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, oh okay. So I, I remember I went to Big Five Sporting Goods. Um, and I bought a stopwatch and I taped Betamax or VHS, I forgot, Super Bowl, you know, football videos. And, and I, I pay attention to the screen transitions, screen wipes, and I timed them. And so the 3DO's CD speed was 2x, meaning 300k per second. And if I knew, so let's just say at the coin toss, after the coin toss, you're going to go into the whatever screen. And we only had like, one or two megabyte of DRAM uh, on 3DO. So you have to keep loading stuff to the DRAM and, and, and VRAM and then, and that's all you have. So you render everything from that screen. And if you need more, uh, then you load from CV, but you have to get rid of this stuff in the DRAM. Anyway, so th there's a lot of uh, garbage collection, all that stuff to do. So I obviously I wrote a system, it's like, a asynchronous file, file IO. So, you know, as you're rendering, you know, the screen was displaying stuff, you could be re hitting the CD at the same time. But the operating system was no good, the 3DS operating system. So I just wrote my own talking to the hardware directly. And, and that was cool, but um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really engineering feat. It was crafting. It was a lot of uh, manual work, like, uh, I can predict what they're going to be using, what assets they'll be using after this scene. So I load them first. And, or, or my, my colleagues at EA, we show a lot of videos, you know, multimedia era. So we show a lot of football footage in the game. And some of the videos were compressed at 240K per second. That was the bit rate. And they, they, they wouldn't go down, uh, uh, go down further because the video would look too bad. So I would do what I call pre-rolling. So I would be, I, I created a ring buffer. So I fill up the ring buffer before I started playing the video. Um, so there's a lot of tricks that we did, but in the end, there's no loading screen. And it kills me that when I play Anthem from EA, the loading time was like minutes. How fast are our hard drive these days, right? And it was just, Insane that it takes forever. Oh wow! They needed you. Huh. Yeah, this was a pretty big hit, as I recall. The three D O was. I mean, the the console. It was issues, right, but it was. Uh, it, it was one of the semi three D football games. 
uh, around. Yeah, this was hard. You know, all these, um, the resolution wasn't that good. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was 320 by 240 or something like that. It's really low resolution. And I had to do uh, anti-aliasing around the letters. Um, so all the fonts, we were doing some kind of uh, translucency around the edges. So they, they look like, you know, TV quality. It wasn't easy. It was, a lot, it was a lot of hard work. And you know, the funny thing is uh, the, the processor of, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the art directors. And he played, <laughs> he played as the rep. Yeah. Oh, that's um, yeah. Um, the, we used ARM processor. And you know, some, 30 some years later, we're still using ARM processor. But you know, it's, it's, it's much more advanced now, but it's the same company. 3DO was one of the earliest companies using ARM processor. Um, and I remember it was a pain in the ass to use it because it didn't have a square root. It didn't have division. Uh, no, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> it was because it's reduced instruction. Yeah, induced uh, instruction. So we, ha we had to do a lot of tricks. Um, so we spent a lot of time on, on optimization. So in the early days, we all had to do a lot of optimizations. And I can't even imagine people before me, you know, on the Genesis and Nintendo, Super Nintendo, that's gotta be worse. Yeah, so, so I think um, easier to develop, give us more creative freedom, it's true. But at the same time, I think people tend to be lazy so we just take the, the comfort or the easiness for granted. And we, we, we forget we're supposed to be more innovative. But, but it, instead, we just make mediocre stuff. You know, renderware, um, uh, let's not talk about renderware. Um, Unity Studio is so easy uh, for people to make games now. And I would say in some cases, they, people do make better games. Um, but we, and, and we do see more game developers overall. And maybe one day we're going to have AI that will take text and give you video games. So instead of text to graphics or te text to video, you're going to, you're going to get one day, you're going to get text to video games. Um, I would say that the bottleneck will be our imagination. We're not, we're not challenging our imagination. You know, look, I played Mid Journey for months now, text to art, and I, I ran out of ideas. I kept telling it, you know, make this, make that, make this, make that, in this style, and that style. And then after a while, you run out of ideas. So I used to think I'm creative, I'm imaginative. Um, yeah, you, we should really put that to the test sometimes. Uh, we, we are not as imaginative or creative as we think. I think, you know, I was, look, I was just thinking more about the sort of hardware challenges you were talking about with the 3DO and the, yeah, you got yeah, the, yeah. the thing doesn't do division and, you know, how can we get rid of the loading screens and all this and sort of thing. But I mean, on the one hand, these are like tangible, concrete challenges. Yeah, you know, like We can... You know, this yeah. is if we can solve this, if we can figure this out, I mean, that's like a big victory, right? And it's it's, it's really yeah. cool working on something like that. And that sort of that sort of uh, in, infuses the whole process, that spirit, right? Uh, yeah. Whereas if you had, you know, if you were doing it today and you had Unity, <laughs> you know, you're making this game and it's like, oh, well, that's no, that'll be easy. You know, no, no, where's the challenge, right? From the, uh, from the yeah. perspective. And if you don't have it, I, I think you, lose some of that creative juice yeah yeah some sometimes i feel like we work around the those uh, obstacles and we ended up having better products you know okay i'll give you a few examples you know the uh, combo in street fighters that was a bug that was a bug so in the code uh, let's just say you have two seconds to to uh enter this move, right? you know, that's a joystick and button combination. And then the, the, the animation will take 2.3 seconds to display. And then after the 2.3 seconds, the game will be ready for you to enter the next move, right? So one programmer put in the wrong time by mistake, 
by accident. So let's just say, instead of 2.3 seconds of blocking input time, he put in one second, which means in the middle of the animation, you can do the next move. So as the animation is finished, the next move will just come out. That's combo. So it, initially it was a bug, but people, players found out about that and they exploited that and they started doing crazy moves. And then initially when it first came out, there's no score associated with that. And then Capcom realized, oh, this is a nice feature. Uh, they, they started counting the, the combos and giving you double combo, triple combo, give you points. Scores actually don't mean anything, don't mean much in, in Street Fighters. It's more important to knock the other person out. But it's cool that they allow a bug to evolve into a cool feature. And that, you can almost say that became the signature of Street Fighters. And all the other games with all the combo systems, it's all coming from this. It's, it's that when you do a move and then you display an animation, let's just say animation at three seconds, after one and a half second, um, it looks like he's still in the middle of the animation. And we humans, normal players, we have the tendency of watching that animation to play through and you do your next move. But experienced players, they're impatient. They just do the next move and it just you know, naturally comes out. Am I, am I confusing you? Uh, that's just, it's a beautiful example, really, of a, it kind of encapsulates everything we've been talking about, right? The, the, the yeah. hardware, the engineers are working, they've got something they think's a bug, limitations. Yes. And then the players, they're not playing the way they're supposed to, right? They're, they're, they've got yeah. creative input as well, the kind of part of the process. And then the wisdom of Capcom, <laughs> you know, the uh -huh. same, like, not, I mean, they could have come in and been like, oh my God, we got to prevent, we got to, you know, prevent these combos, right? But that's not how, yeah. I mean, they could have had that mindset, but they had the, yeah. You know, I think their insight is valuable here as well. And like you say, you know, it becomes the whole spirit of the game. Yes, yes. So I think those uh, accidents, accidents and yeah. yes, and, and, and yeah, and the technical limitations, I think they're in a way serendipitous and they're beautiful. Let's see, I, we've, we talked already quite a bit. I don't want to take up your whole day. I don't know what kind of time you're. <laughs> Holy crap. It's been an hour and 40 minutes already. You want or to uh, one and a half hours. Yeah. We could probably cover a couple more things, huh? Okay. And so you talked to God, there's so many things we, we could talk about here. I got like pages and pages of notes I'm going through here, but yeah, maybe I, I you know, I still kind of come back to this this sort of fascination I have with just the geography. Of your biography, if you will. Oh, being in, yeah. being in Taiwan and sort of being at the hub. Yeah, so you're you're there. You're seeing the the Japanese games. You're seeing the American games. You you're saving up to buy an Apple II <laughs> knockoff. Yeah, you know, I, I never thought no, I, mean, I would be. You're, just, you're seeing. I, mean, I don't know anybody. Where else could you yeah. be? Just have that that sort of perspective. Where you're seeing this whole inner this industry evolve and the, and the differences between yeah. the the players involved and and you're still kind of there at the yeah I'm still trying to, I'm still, trying to understand yeah. like what's my what's nose the, is still pretty close to the grindstone yeah so we want to re <laughs> release a game in, in China you know but that, that should be easy well no you got, no <laughs> there's things to no. have to know yeah yeah. You know, it's just not this um, world that we live in, right? There's all these different factors and distinctions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, look, I I saw the leaked video of GTA, and I I felt something. I was like, I felt like, hey, I understand with the new graphics engine, we can do lifelike videos, but we don't have to show shooting people in the face, you know? Like seriously, like I understand that will that will attract a lot of attention, mm -hmm. but we don't have to go there. You know, like you don't have to shoot people in the face in, in video games. I mean, I understand why not, right? I, I understand freedom of, of expression, but uh, 
There's so many other beautiful things in the world that we, we could be showing, you know, <laughs> as, as video game makers. No, seriously, I played the first GTA and I was in London. I've always been the, doing that kind of thing. You know, do you, do you even think that, I don't know if they I haven't really read too much about this leak, but, you know, sometimes I wonder if that stuff wasn't even planned, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, so I guess my point is I was um, I was in London back in 98, 99 when the first GTA came out, right. and it was top down. It was top down. So, you know, when you shoot cops, it they were just pixelated, you know, characters, and it didn't – it was funny. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. It was um, – you know our uh for, you know sort of satisfying our rebellious nature you know like shooting cops take away the, the cop cars and then try to drive away but they were very pixelated cartoon art you know and so now when it's so realistic you 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 rob people you hijack a, a, a hijack the restaurant and yeah top down Original GTA, yes, yes. Original GTA was top down. Everything was pixelated. Yeah, it was want, not. I don't want. It to, was not state of the art. I yeah. don't want to interrupt the flow, but you know, it's my understanding that this game too is one of those examples where there was a bug. You know, was they or something that they construed as a well. This is problematic because it's too easy to run into other other cars. You know, it's too hard to not get into an yeah. accident. Somebody having the brilliance to come along and say, "No, that's actually that's actually fun. We should just roll with this uh, idea. It'll be more fun than the original plan." Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> there are quite a few. There are quite a few video games later that was focusing on getting away, right? Your getaway driving, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's, I think that's all fun. I just, yeah, I, you know, when I see uh, you picking a male or female character and shooting people in the face. Um, I, part of me feels sad. Like, oh, we don't, we don't have to do this, you know, in, in game industry. So I think part of me is protective of the industry. Like I, I would, yeah, I, I hope this industry doesn't have to go in that direction. And, and I guess the industry will go in all directions. Um, yeah, but part of me, I think it's the romance. You know, I miss my, my days at EA. I, I miss my youth. I was the youngest guy at EA. Can you believe that? Uh, and I, I enjoy uh, just, just having a, being able to go to a place and, and, and really put my talent on display and put, put them in, in, in a game so other, other kids can, can enjoy my, my hard work. And, and man, it was hard work. It was crazy hard work. Uh, I slept under the desk. Sometimes uh, it gets too, too. Yeah, I did. And, and uh, it was crazy. Spending Christmas Eve in the office. Spending the entire summer, summer vacation in the, in the office. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, you're sacrificing your life, you know, for the, for the work. But the work is art, so it's it's kind of hard for the family to understand. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the good people they they screw up, they lost their marriage, you know, over over this trade, uh, and it's it's difficult for people outside of the trade to understand what is the draw here. But anyway, yeah, I was just thinking remember what, the whole EA spouse. The ball. I guess that's probably a decade old now. Sacrificing for art. That's a immortal theme. Well, let's see. What else? We I don't want to take up your whole day. There's just so much we could talk about. I see you did license uh, Gordon Ramsay. Oh yeah. <laughs> for Chef Blast. And let's you work you well, work Pony Ma, I, Timothy Chen, Yoshiko. Okimo, Okimoto. Oh. Uh, yeah, Masayoshi song. Yeah, so Yoshi, Yoshiki Okamoto, he was my senpai. That's mentor in, in Japanese. And he's the creator of Street Fighters. So um, it's not like I'm a, just a pretty damn good mentor. <laughs> yeah, 
And wow. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from him. And yeah, I just felt like I was just a dude in game industry and who, who takes his job seriously. I mean, he's sometimes too seriously. Um, yeah, I, I'm a workaholic. I'm, I've always been a workaholic. Uh, I, I find my, my use or my worth through my work. And, and I understand it's unhealthy, but it works for me. Um, you know, I'm obsessed with, 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 with what I do. I'm literally obsessed. Um, so, yeah, for me, the, the whole experience at Capcom was somewhat spiritual. It was like a religious experience. Really? The whole time I was, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like a totally different culture, different way of making video games different way of looking at games, different way of looking at your jobs and, you know, the obedience and the, the sense of honor, you, pride you take in, in what you do. It's just totally different. And I tried to replicate some of that in Accolade after I left Capcom. Oh, I, mean, I remember I, I cried when I left Capcom. I cried in front of people <laughs> when I left Capcom. Uh, and you under bad circumstances or what was the... Or you just oh, I was, I was, no, I was, I was crying because I wasn't, there was too much politics in the office. Oh. And, and I remember I cried to my best friend, uh, Tetsuya Ijima. And I said, I was, you know, tear all over my face. I said, I just want to make games. Uh, and, I, you know, I wasn't, I was in my thirties, you know, like 31, 30. And, and uh, I wasn't very good at office politics, you know, so I just, you know, watch things happen, and, and I was helpless in, in allowing these things to happen. And uh, yeah, I didn't think about credit. You know, I thought people are all in generally in general nice and fair. Uh, didn't care about you know who who has the credit and that that kind of stuff. And so anyway, um, as you move up in the ranks, you started taking on a lot of uh, bureaucracy and responsibilities you know my first job as, as a producer at capcom was to lay off the entire team sometimes i feel like your team that was your first job yeah, yeah. wow that sounds like you got thrown yeah, I know. the lions yeah better. but they are going to lay off the team whether or without with, without me you know they were going to do that whether with or without me so which way is better at least you know if i if it was left to, for me to do it. Let's just say I give every, every person one month severance. I could tell them, look, you don't have to tell your next employer you got laid off. Go look for a job now, you have one month. And so it's the same amount of money, but it just sounds a lot better. Mm -hmm. And I did the same thing at Accolade again, but I got uh, seriously backslashed because those people, they had one month to look at me in my face uh, and, and, and hating me. And, you know, uh, right before I laid them off, it was like a week. Uh, so a week before I was told to lay them off, that project was given to me. So I don't even know these people. So this happened to me at Accolade again. They gave me this team and said, and, and one week later they said, okay, uh, we need to lay them off. This was the and test drive I, road two. This, this was slave zero. Uh, test drive, Two and three, we we were successful in launching those, those games. So for, those were my projects. But Slave Zero, uh, that was that wasn't my project. It was given to me, and then I was told to lay them. Off. So I told them, "You have one month to look for another job." And hey, at least I can look at myself in the mirror, you know, because every one of them, every single one of them, found jobs within that one month. I didn't want them to have a like being laid off in, in their uh, resume. Or in their in their record, uh, but because of that, they get to stay in the office and and uh, give me shit all day long, uh, and and I, and I just have to eat it. I just have to eat it. Uh, Tough. So, yeah, sometimes you do the hard things not because they're easy, you know. What do the right things not because they're easy? <laughs> Hopefully, they didn't hold a grudge. Probably not. Um, <laughs> it, it's easier well, to be a programmer. 
it's easier to be a programmer. It's easier to be a game developer. As you move up the ranks, you get more and more uh, of the responsibilities that you, you didn't ask for. But that's, that just comes with the territory. Well, just to, right. just to wrap things up, I think, I, I like to ask people, you know, to think about maybe a younger version of yourself, you know, like what if you were maybe 15, 16 years old, or maybe thinking about college, you know, about to graduate high school, and you, you just really want to do the games industry. You know, you got that passion. You're not sure really, like, what should I do? How should I go? I mean, what, what advice would you give that that kid? Wow. Okay. I, I, get, I guess I would try to have them try to write down or put down what is the game they're trying to make? Well, what, what, what would they like to do? Which role they would like to take in the, in the, in the industry? And, and start sort of reaching out to people who are doing that right now. You know, if you want to get to be a game designer, if you want to be an artist or a programmer or, a, or producer, uh, go find a person who's doing that right now and maybe talk to three, three of them and see if you still like that job. Because it, it would suck if you spend the next 10 years, you know, you know, going in that direction only to realize you actually don't like it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. And, and also involved that people might, I think you had a phrase somewhere I ran across. It was like, Making games is not all games, or <laughs> it's not yeah, all. Fun. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. don't and I, see the amount of work and and toil. One more thing I want to say, real quick, is uh, I want to remind people in that age, kids in that age. Paintball construction said, "I forgot who did it, I, but I, I I knew this gentleman." Uh, is that Stuart Smart. Smith? I think, or maybe it's music construction said. When he did it, he was told. And and Mark, Matt Cerny, yeah, Stuart Smith, it, was a venture construction. Okay, and, uh, let's, okay. Pinball, yeah, and uh, it was Bill Bunch. Pinball construction. Okay, Bunch. these people are all super young, and uh, Matt Cerny, I forgot what he did, but he started in his teens, low teens, and I started when I was eighteen. Um, so you don't have to stop for anything. You don't have to wait till you know you go to a computer science degree get a get a degree you can just read books and just start doing it the the tools are so easy these days you can do it in roblox you can do do it with the Menticore or the core uh, there's so many tools out there you know there's a new no code movement right no code no code and involved movement so you can in theory make games with no code so there's no excuses why you cannot do it so that's i just want to put that out there no excuses. Maybe they can be like you and take these games apart and see if you can put them back together in a little bit. Of... <laughs> that sounds like it'd still be a pretty cool method to learn the, the craft. Oh, yeah, you bet. There's a lot of free uh, open source games out there. And... That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, got a lot of uh, great interviews in the pipes. So I'll be sharing some more information about that, of course, on the Discord channel. And, of course, we have episode 500 coming up. And I thought, you know, as we get closer to that, I want to do some uh, more live uh, streaming type episodes where we can uh, maybe work with Discord somehow so we can have some comments and questions going as we... Uh, or live streaming so i'm gonna you know that's currently in the works i'll let you know i'll post some uh, updates on that as we finalize the plans over on the patreon page uh, so keep an eye on that uh and of course if you are supporting the show uh, through patreon thank you very very much you are making these episodes and interviews possible these just would not exist without your support so thank you very, very much for supporting the show. Uh, it's always exciting to uh, see the new folks. Uh, and if you are on the uh, Patreon page, don't forget about the Discord chat. Lots of great stuff going on there. You get access to it if you support the show at any amount. Uh, so head over to that link in the show notes of the Patreon page. Only a buck 
is all I ask, one buck a month. If you can afford that, <laughs> I could use the money. Uh, so head over there, and thank you very, very much to everyone who has supported it. And if you're still thinking about it, come on. You really like the show a lot better if you support it. All right, so anyway, thanks again. Uh, what about that news for the Matt Cage? Oh, yes. Got some uh, great news here. A lot of uh, news that uh, isn't going to cost you anything. <laughs> That's always good. Miko wrote in about a couple of things here. One is, uh, I think Punny might have wrote, written in about this too, Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. It's a great game. One of the best uh, CRPGs I've played in recent memory. Uh, well, they have done a uh, uh, an update for that. It's free. It's, um, what are they calling this? A quality of life features, UI improvements, controller support. <laughs> okay, now that one, I don't give a rat's ass. <laughs> Who wants to play these games with the game pad? You know, okay, but you know, if that's what floats your boat, hey, you can do it now. Uh, they got new mythic content, uh, so it's not. Just, it's, it's a lot of new content as well as some really cool uh, UI stuff. You know, it's always uh, fun to me. Yeah, they say you can finally pl uh, play with a controller. Yeah. Lead from the comfort of your own pillow fort. Uh, I don't know about that one, but you can, let's see, customize your character's appearance by coloring and reforging armor. Save time for that specific scroll with an inventory search function. Oh, that's, a, that's <laughs> you know, that sounds like a small thing, but, you know, hey, if you play this game, you know, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, I think they had uh, something about a new, you can get more information about your roles. I believe I saw one of these things here somewhere. Kind of getting lost in my notes. Oh, here we go. Uh, enhanced battle log. So if you're like me, you like to look at these things, see how they're computing all these game mechanics, see the die rolls and everything. So that's, you can uh, get more information about that. So anyway, it just sounds really, really cool. Uh, if you haven't played Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous since it came out, you know, this sounds like a great opportunity to jump back in, maybe create a different kind of character, put a new party together, try out some of these new bells and whistles. Sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, also, there's a game, Game Deck, G or Game D E C. Uh, for some reason, this one kind of slipped under my radar, but they are out with a definitive edition. Uh, kind of an isometric game, I believe it's Cyberpunk. If I'm not horribly mistaken here, uh, but again, if you already own the game, this is a free update. You can um, immerse yourself in Seven, the days long gone. Uh, what else they've got here? Game is completely readable to those who played neither of the previous games. I'm trying to figure out what. Oh, ex expand, expect the brand new virtual, virtualium, <laughs> virtualium, <laughs> and more challenging NPCs. Uh, so we've got a great update with the uh, new content as well as new uh, features that make the game more to play. You know, I just got to say, you know, somebody now that I've been working on my own uh, role-playing game CRPG for a while. You know, I've got an all-new appreciation for the UI, uh, the user interface uh, of these games. It's an easy thing. It, it's one of those unfortunate aspects where if it's done really well, you don't even notice it. You're just like, wow, this game is, you know, is really smooth. It makes sense the way that uh, <laughs> it's easy to control. It's easy to get into. Uh, without realizing, you know, the, the, the talent, the skill, the attention to detail that it requires uh, to really make a, a solid, usable UI, user interface. <laughs> and so it's one of those things I, I tend to really uh, admire uh, these days more than I, I used to. So anyway, it's it's always good to see and try to learn from uh, these uh, uh, these updates as they're making improvements and you, you can test it out and see, well, does that, you know, maybe that inventory search thing, <laughs> you know, how big of a difference does that make and is it worth, is that something you'd like to have in every game going forward? You know, you you really notice it too when you. I've been uh, going back and playing some of the enhanced editions like Baldur's Gate, and, and yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, I know they're, they're kind of controversial. Some folks say, "Oh, just you know, I can just play the original. Uh, I don't need the mods or anything like that." But uh, man, I do. <laughs> yeah, it can make a game. It can make an old game feel like a brand new game. Just, just some great UI quality of life enhancements. Uh, you'd really be surprised. Uh, so uh, anyway, just put that out there. 
Oh, what else we got here? Tired Gaming Dad and Miko uh, running about a, let's see, uh, what's this game called? Zoria Age of Shattering. This is a squad-based tactical RPG. Oh. <laughs> Words to warm the heart. Squad-based tactical RPG is my favorite. Uh, fluid turn-based combat. Outpost and follower management set in the expansive fantasy world of Zoria. So I know next to nothing about this game. Maybe, maybe it'd be a good uh, game to look at in a future man chat. Sounds uh, really cool. Uh, anyway, that is... Uh, I got a little time, I guess, because planned release date is 2023, but you can download a demo, I believe. And, and speaking of which, uh, Matt, or speaking of demos, Matt wrote in, Matt Workula, about a new demo for Scald. We've got a project update, new demo launching, new key art, some updates with game mechanics, plans for that game. You know, we're keeping an eye on that one, of course, uh, so you can check out the new demo. Just, I think it might have just came out today, actually. And so definitely go check that out. All right, well, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes, uh, and I kind of got sidetracked looking at proverbs. I was looking for Chinese proverbs. <laughs> There's so much wisdom. You just do like a Google search for Chinese proverbs. and I mean, you, you, I think you'll be impressed. Uh, there's a lot of great ones, a lot of funny ones too. And, you know, I like a little humor mixed in with my, my wisdom. And I just thought this one was great. <laughs> it goes something like this. Experience. Okay. Experience is a comb which nature gives us when we are bold. Experience is a comb that nature gives us when we are bold. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm not bald yet. Uh, anyway, uh, hope you enjoyed that and ponder on that. And see you next time. They do not feel pain. They do not love.